10 years ago, I was a regular guy. I was in my mid-30s, working in telecom, had a little success under my belt. And I was looking for an idea, a big, hairy, audacious idea, a global trend, something that I could get out in front of, become an expert in, and when the rest of the world arrived there, create wealth, make the world a better place. Around the same time, the United Nations was telling us, we need to prepare for another 2.5 billion people on the planet by 2050. Two things struck me about that. First, I'll be 80, both the end of my effective life. And two, if there is that many of us on the planet, the resources that we need to live will be in serious jeopardy. So I picked up the July 2006 issue of Popular Science. It said 10 technologies to end our oil addiction. That seemed like a cool place to start, might be something there. And I'm tearing through all these really neat stories. And I get to page 61, a little two-inch sidebar story said, case study, the electric farmers. These folks were using their cow poop to make a whole bunch of electricity that they were selling. Of all the ideas I saw that day, this is the one that stuck. There was no fanfare, there was no aha, big eureka moment, it was just, hmm. And so began a very strange and radical change of life for me and the end of my being a regular guy. So I never intended to become an expert in the subject matter that I did. <laughs> There's still a lot of stuff about the physical properties I am not crazy about. But the delta between what was and what could be was so big and the potential was so right. I now know more about this. I believed was knowledge in the whole world. So today, I'm going to take you through poop soup <laughs> to the inevitable global movement. <laughs> Here's a little bit of what I know. Just like that story, we got cows here and they poop. There's about 58,000 active milking cows in this province producing 1.5 billion kilograms of manure every year. That's a big number, hard to, uh, hard to visualize. I can help you out. <laughs> Just up the road from here, we have BC Play Stadium. 10 acres of footprint, 19 stories high. If we took all that poop and put it in there at one time, we can fill it 12 stories deep. <laughs> You'll never look at that place the same again, yeah? <laughs> We've also got a lot of chickens here. There's about 92 and a half million birds being raised at any given time in British Columbia. And just like the cows, they poop a lot. Another 1.2 billion kilograms. If we pile all that into BC Play Stadium, we can fill it right to the top. Now, poop, as it comes out of cows and chickens, it's just biological leftovers. It's all the things that a plant needs but it's not quite ready for the plants. It smells bad. It's got a whole bunch of bacteria in it. There's nutrients that the plants can't get at, and there's still a bunch of energy in it. When we spread it on the fields raw, as is common practice, that energy, methane, is released to the environment 23 times more damaging than CO2. Any nutrients that the plants can't get at right away, any excess beyond what they need, it can leak away into the soil and the air and the water. That leaking is one of the major issues in food production today. Something natural like manure can become pollution. At the beginning of the agrarian age, we used all the manure we had back on the fields where we grew the next round of crops. Today in the Fraser Valley, we have the, the most productive soil, we have incredible climate, but we've got some of the most expensive farmland anywhere in the world. It means a very large portion of our feed for the animals is imported from somewhere else. An economically sustainable farm needs to deal with their manure in the least expensive ways, which means spreading it right by their farm. Now here, the cycle is broken. The excess nutrients we have, they've got value. They're just hard to get at because they're wrapped up in water. You can't afford to drive dilute fertilizer very far. Now an important ingredient of that fertilizer is phosphorus. 
We cannot do industrial scale agriculture the way that we do without phosphorus fertilizer. Globally, it's recognized that phosphorus availability may be the largest single threat to food production as we know it. Many areas are or will be starving for it. We're swimming in it. This is an opportunity. I want you to picture zero waste agriculture. That right there is what most people think of when I ask them to do that, but I am not talking about blue sky. This is for real. Today, I'll give you a concrete example that zero waste agriculture is possible. We've been working for more than 10 years to unlock this potential, and I'm excited to say we are at risk of becoming an overnight success. <laughs> Back to where I started today, 10 years ago, I was looking for an idea, a global trend, one that I could become an expert in and wait for the world to arrive. When I looked to the future, I could see one absolute inescapable truth. As long as we have living creatures on this planet, we need to have food. And we need to have water. And if we're living well, we need energy. The opportunity that I identified is resource efficiency. Driving value by eliminating waste and wastefulness. But how? We begin to move towards zero waste agriculture when we change the way we think, away from food, energy, and water in isolation, as many do. That piece by piece thinking leaks at the edges. They miss the power of harmonization. The key to making this work is we have to move up a context to where we address food, energy, and water together. This is the magic move that will advance resource efficiency in food production by a magnitude. We go from being local and linear to being systemic and exponential. So remember the electric farmers? They build something called an anaerobic digester or a biogas plant. It's really just a great big poo pot. They feed theirs cow manure and leftovers from an ice cream plant and fryer oil and a bunch of other things that still have energy in it that they can digest. That one there is the first industrial scale poo pot for agriculture. I built that in Abbotsford about an hour up the road from here. We feed that man the manure from 800 cows, 100,000 chickens, and another 25% is off farm material, uh, industrial food processing waste. We put it in those tanks, we mix it up, and we cook it for 25 days. That methane I talked about, we capture it, we clean it, we put it in the grid, we deliver it to about 1,000 homes and businesses across the province. And every day, that facility puts out about eight tanker truckloads of beautiful, plant-available, bacteria-free, non-stinky fertilizer. But no matter how much better the soup was that we made than the ingredients that went in, people weren't lining up to buy it. So here I was, five years into my mission and back, looking for another big, hairy, audacious idea. What to do with all that poo? <laughs> I stumbled on a story, crazy story, about Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. Said a large part of the surface of the lake is covered by something called duckweed. Duckweed? Said they're spending $2 million a month to try to deal with it because the nutrients running into the lake from farms around them. Said the only thing that works is physically harvesting it. No chemical or biological treatment can stop it. It said all of their efforts are barely keeping up with the growth. I thought to myself, this thing is a horse of epic proportions. If that plant can be used for anything, I want it in my barn. It about blew my mind when I found it. It can be food. I immediately fell in love with the duckweed family. That's just five of them. We work with the middle child, their lamna, because that was in our ditch at our farm. The whole family is nothing short of a, a wonder of the world. They're all opportunists. They just want to grow. And they do anywhere that they can find nutrients and water and sun. Most of them can double themselves in as little as 48 hours and we can, we can separate them into food and sugars through simple fermentation. 
I look forward to the day that we're making whiskey and people food. In the meantime, we're doing animal feed and sugars for the chemical industry. And I'm not the first guy to figure out the power of duckweed. It's used, it's a staple of the diet in parts of the world. There's hundreds and hundreds of studies done on its potential, but in this hemisphere, it is grossly overlooked. It eats nutrients, cleaning water, it eats huge amounts of CO2, gives us food and sugar. It is the missing link. Here's what we did with it. Zero waste agriculture. We recognize we need food, we need water, we need energy. We've got chickens and cows to give us food. They also give us poop. We can cook that in our big poop pot, making methane energy delivered to homes and businesses around the province, and beautiful fertilizer that is right and ready for the duckweed family. They get to do in their job, and they give us water and food, feed for the animals and another energy product. The food we can eat or we can give back to the animals along with the water that we've harvested. There is a team of people working right now on a solution that feeds poop soup and CO2 into trays growing duckweed inside of a container with no environmental losses at all. This solution has the potential to deliver up to 100 times the amount of food that corn or soy can, and we can install it anywhere on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, that right there is zero waste agriculture, the inevitable global movement.